webinar called So welcome everybody to our webinar um, uncovering the hidden curriculum, which is aimed at identifying the unspoken rules that are necessary to gain academic success. I am Paige Greenwood and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. And I'm also a BIN co-founder and co-lead of the professional development program. This session will be recorded and um, we will also have live captioning available for everyone, which is located at the bottom of the screen um, and is the tab that has the word CC and live transcript. You can also use the chat function to ask questions. If you are unable to attend any of our previous sessions, please check out our YouTube page where we have all of our events throughout the years and Black and, Neuro's, um, Black and Neuro Week um, events are also available there. We also have our past NIH webinar recorded online and is available um, within our webinar series. To stay up to date with our future events, you can join our mailing list. And lastly, we are currently looking for speakers for our BIN seminar series. So please nominate speakers using the link that will be posted in the chat. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our incredible panelists who will be here to talk about the um, hidden curriculum within academia. Um, starting with Dr. Villanueva, um, for the past 11 years, Dr. Villanueva has worked on several engineering and education projects where she derives from her experiences in engineering to improve outcomes for minoritized groups in engineering using mixed and multimodal methods and approaches. She currently is an associate professor in the engineering education department at the University of Florida. In 2019, she received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. and um, also began her NSF career project on the hidden curriculum in engineering. Dr. Idalas Villanueva has a BS in degree in chemical engineering from the University of Puerto Rico and an MS and PhD degree in chemical and biological engineering from the University of Colorado Boulder. Soon after, she completed her postdoctoral fellowship from the National Institutes of Health and Analytical Cell Biology in Bethesda, Maryland and worked as a lecturer for two years before transitioning to the tenure track in engineering education. Her experiences as a first generation engineer, Latinx woman of color, introvert, and a mother has shaped the lens um, and approaches that she uses in her research. She hopes that her work will not only change normative ways of knowing, but also research scholarship in critical and equitable ways. Welcome Dr. Villanueva. I would also like to welcome Dr. Sean Hercules, um, who earned his, um, his PhD in Dr. Juliet Daniels Research Lab at McMaster University, which has focused on investigating the disease trends and genetics of Nigerian, Barbadian, and Jamaican women with aggressive triple negative breast cancer. Sean is now a postdoctoral research fellow in Dr. Kamakoka's research group at Princess Margaret Cancer Center with a focus on breast cancer prevention in women at high risk for breast cancer. Sean is passionate about the inclusion of previously understudied populations in genomics research and engaging health disparities work. Sean is also passionate about science communication and challenging racial and cis heteronormative stereotypes in, st in science. Welcome, Sean. Um, and last but not least, I would also like to um, introduce Fatmata Dharami, and who is um, a graduate with her degree in biological sciences and neuroscience. She also has her master's of science in educational neuroscience. She currently works as a widening participation and student success manager, where she uses her lived experiences in scientific knowledge and educational neuroscience to improve the student attainment of black, Asian and minority ethnic minority students. Um, I'm so happy to have you all today and to be able to ask you some questions about the hidden curriculum. So going into our first question, I know we've all been in spaces where we didn't necessarily feel like we knew all of the rules when we were transitioning into academia, whether it was our background being a first-gen student, a person of color. Um, and I really wanna understand from you all's perspective, what your definition of the hidden curriculum was and how it played a role in your experiences in academia. Anybody can answer that. Um, 
I can go first, um, if that's okay. So my first experience with the hidden cur curriculum came from when I was about 14. And my teacher specifically was talking about um, Philip Jackson, who is a sociologist who essentially coined the term. And I remember him saying, um, you know, when, when, when everyone grows up and you're going to go out into the world, you might not always know what's going on or, um, or what to say or how to behave. And as a student, I thought he has no idea what he's talking about. We all know what's going on. And it actually wasn't until I was in my third, third year of um, uni, I was working as a student ambassador on a specific summer school and we essentially had this like really fancy meal at the the very end and the menu had something which I called just so I basically said what is just and the table went super quiet and it was just really like oh gosh what did I just say and then someone not kind of nicely said it's Jew and I was like I still don't know what that means I still don't know what that is and they all thought oh yeah you know it's French and it's gravy and I thought that is not something I would have ever come across and from then on I started noticing just kind of little random things that I kind of either wouldn't know or that just wouldn't be a norm for me. So I would define it as just kind of written rules of um, normative patterns, but then also specific pieces of knowledge that someone like me who is from a low socioeconomic background, black, female, um, just wouldn't know that stuff. And it makes it a little bit more difficult to integrate into the environment you are in thank you for sharing that story Fatma, Fatmata. um i um you know it's interesting because i think um hidden curriculum like many definitions evolves over time it's a process it's not something that will remain static um and so uh you know you know, if we ascribe to Philip Jackson's definition, it was more of a communicative type of lens for hidden curriculum, thinking about, you know, what are those communication patterns that happen in the classrooms that really guide behavior and, you know, or the expectations of behavior in a classroom, like children need to be quiet, children need to raise their hands, you know, that type of behavior that would dictate how you're gonna succeed in the classroom. But over time, if you if you look at the history of hidden curriculum, you know, like people like um, Bordeaux, Michael Apple, other researchers started seeing, wait a minute, this is more than just what happens inside the classroom. This is what happens outside of the classroom. This is now viewed as a systemic type of problem, right? And so, um, you know, in a nutshell, the, the, the general definition is this unwritten rule of the road, unwritten norms, views, values, beliefs, attitudes that inform an individual about how they belong or if they don't belong or um, what is needed to be in the know-how um, is, is normally what it's defined. I think lately I've been defining it more as the messages that are transmitted from systems that are sustained and supported uh, structurally. Um, and, I, I, and I say that because I, I think that as students, as faculty, uh, we end up in these systems that, or where these rules are made without us knowing how they were made to begin with, you know, this, these black boxes. And then all of a sudden, um, someone tells you, well, you should have known that. Why should you have known that? Were you part of the table to begin with to make those rules and those norms? Um, and um, you know, for me, I think I've experienced it my entire life as a first generation Latina student. I didn't know things about college that I, I guess 
I was supposed to know. Um, and, you know, I always felt that, why don't I know? Is it a problem with me? You know, and I, and I think a lot of people of color, minoritized, marginalized groups sort of point the finger here. Um, and it wasn't until I discovered the term hidden curriculum that I said, oh, wait a minute, this isn't me. This is the system, right? Um, and when I realized that it was the systemic systems problem, I, it just changed my view of how to navigate, change a view of myself. Um, I think in many ways it did save me from this constant struggle of feeling like I didn't belong. You know, like, wait a minute, I do belong and I can make a change in these hidden curriculums. So now I use it to advocate and help other students and faculty to succeed and, and realize this is not them. Yeah, um, I'll go next. Um, so I completely agree with many of the things that um, you both said um, and identify with them. Like I was also the first uh, person in my immediate family to attend university. Um, my undergrad, I, I didn't really know to navigate the system. That's like, because, you know, it was all new, right? Like my family couldn't really help me. I essentially had to figure out everything um, for myself. Um, and I actually didn't feel that excited about my undergrad and I didn't go to my graduation. I just was like, yay, I have a degree. <laughs> um, and then I did my master's and I, I think it was probably around then that I started um, more seeing this hidden curriculum um, because uh, there were people in my, in my program that had more connections or, or were able to just navigate the system in a way that I would not have been able to. Um, but I did my undergrad and master's in Barbados. Then I moved to Canada and then it was like, oh, okay, <laughs> um, this is, it's a completely different ball game um, because, you know, in Barbados, I like, essentially like black people are the the majority in Barbados compared to in Canada now like I am the only black person in the room in most regards especially at scientific um in, in scientific regards um and what was always weird to me was that people would see me and uh, we talk about oh like I'm in grad school whatever and they're like oh, okay like okay so like you're 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 in humanities right and I'm like <laughs> what <laughs> Like, uh, yeah, it, it was really weird and icky feeling. And, you know, I also saw um, secondhand because my my PhD supervisor, um, Dr. Juliet Daniel, she was the only black female professor in the faculty of science for the past 20 years, um, which is. I, I don't understand how that is. Like Canada is supposed to be so diverse. Um, but just seeing all the hoops and hurdles that she's had to jump through and how she navigated the system to, to uh, you know, have some level of success at the university was really, really eye-opening for me. And I just, from like in that moment, I realized everything is politics. Everything is who you know. Like it's, you just have to play the game to get through an academia and that sucks, you know? It's a lot of mental energy that, that you have to exert um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and even something as simple as writing grants, like you put so much effort into writing this grant, but you know um, the big shot, the big name uh, labs will still get this money regardless of how hard you work to, to write these grants. So yeah, it's, I, I, for me, my definition of hidden curriculum is is politics. Um, it's a very short definition, but it's it's pretty uh, all encompassing. You know, one thing that I'm hearing in common between all of you all is that academia is political, but the hidden curriculum is within academia is systemic, and within academia um, or academic institutions often adhere to this code of conduct in the workplace, which is 
often tangled with the concept of professionalism that is rooted in westernized respectability politics and socialization for historically excluded students, how could this impact their success in academia? Um, so I think this this is really in to, to rest in and I still still wrestle with this even you know after education and um, working in but specifically in terms of um, mannerisms and the kind of ways um, westernized people sort of present themselves it can sometimes be um, sometimes quite a uh, stoic so in the um, UK, it's, you know, you've got to have a stiff upper lip, you've got to be super proper. Um, and sometimes it's a little bit placid. So I grew up um, in an area that was predominantly black in inner city London. Everyone was black. Even the white people were black. It was insane. And in terms of us being kind of really expressive, I talk a lot with my hands, I'm doing it now, my tone cha changes. I thought, yeah, that's, that is just normal. However, when doing things like presentations, it's kind of deemed as, uh, they are jittery. Is this person concentrating? And it's like, no, I'm just passionate about what I'm talking about. So for me i've kind of seen that especially students who are traditionally excluded your kind of culture and the way you see being professional just doesn't add up um you might laugh a bit too loud i know that sometimes in places it's like why are you so happy um and one thing i i actually studied and i did my my research on was about anxiety and that kind of um, respectability politics and that pressure to be the good one, to be the good black one, to not be super feisty, it starts to constantly play on our students' minds and they're constantly thinking, how do I look? How do I sound? Am I using my hands too much? And that then takes away mental resources from your actual brain and then you can't actually concentrate you can't actually focus on on whatever it is you're doing and from like attentional control theory and kind of lots of other research we know that the anxiety can play an um, impact in your academic success so just to say it is a huge web of things you're constantly thinking about in terms of fitting in and that anxiety does kind of start taking away your resources that you could actually just be using to just read that book or just to to read that paper but I still struggle with it I'm not going to um to say I've got it right I always um make mistakes and sometimes on purpose because why not Yeah, I, I appreciate that because I, I do think that professionalization is one of those structures that is being used to support hidden curriculum. Um, I, I don't know why I what, what you just said uh, brought to mind um, professionalization also in uh, job interviews and how you prepare. <laughs> You know, I, I've, I've been into too many professional societies and conferences where they tell students, well, you need to dress this way, you need to act this way, you need to have certain amount of shoes, certain length in your, you know, in, in your pants or whatever. Um, and then there's these rules that they tell you, if you do not look a certain way, they're not going to even look at you, right? Um, and I think that that's really interesting because um, it really does affect things like getting a job, right? And um, uh, unfortunately, I think we're still behind the times in many of those things. Um, I, I just, I'm just recalling a conversation that um, a colleague of mine and I were having with a grad student who was in the process of getting her first faculty position. And one of the faculty said, well, um, if you, you know, if you plan to have children's, don't mention a thing. Don't say anything on the job, you know, like on the job interview. And I said, why not? She's interviewing them. 
right? Um, and I think, and I said, absolutely tell them that you want to have kids and see how they respond because you want to see the environment that you're in. You want to know before you get in there, where, what are you getting into, right? This isn't just them interviewing you. This is you interviewing them and sort of flipping that switch and saying, you have power in this situation. You're not powerless, right? But there's still these old school ideas of, you know, how should you be working or getting a job or in the workplace? And I, I agree that it's, it's a difficult subject, but I think, you know, I think it's all of our duties to start changing those lenses and changing those ideas of what, what is normative and what is not. Yeah, I completely agree. I also want to um, like add a few points to that. Um, I also like I <clears throat> I think about professionalism and um, a lot. I hate the whole professional structure. It doesn't give me flexibility to be myself, and that irritates me so much. Um, like for instance, um, people have told me, um, okay, Sean, like maybe not post this on your Instagram or maybe not tweet this because like you want a job afterwards. And I'm like, I don't want to work for um, an institution that is going to not, that's, that's going to judge me based off of those things because I am, sure an academic but i'm also a, like a person outside of that like a hundred percent of my life is not consumed with science i mean there are some people like that and that's completely fine for them but everyone does not fit into that box and i'm definitely not in that box and i i i do i do feel judged a lot of the time but um i'm not letting that stop me from being myself so even I remember when I first started, I guess, saying um, it's going to be Sean, um, like people would be like, oh, like, why are you like wearing makeup today? And I said, oh, because I felt like <laughs> they thought like there was a, a reason, like I was going to a function or like some lunch, something. It's like, no, I just, this is just what I feel like doing. So I'm just going to do that. Um, and our lab was a very, uh, you, uh, it was a very fun lab. We had like a great lab culture and we would be playing music, dancing, um, Afrobeats, soca, dance hall, everything while doing our experiments. Um, and people would like pass by our lab and just like, what's happening in there? <laughs> like, it, this is not normal. Like y'all are not real scientists. Like we always get, we always got that type of perception because we were like the room wasn't quiet. We weren't like always talking about papers. Like we just talked about normal life stuff, which I think is healthy, right? Um, so yeah, that's my that's my view on professionalism and people who don't fit the box, you know, are not set up to succeed. Um, and that's not how it should be. And I'm happy to um to take a few hits along the way for to open doors for people um, that may not fit into that box. Yeah, what you just said is such a valid point, like trying to fit into the confinement of the academia box. Um, sometimes as a person of color can be so tricky. Um, academia can definitely create this cascade of imposter syndrome in ourselves um, and not thinking that we're worthy or valuable or we're an asset to these institutions sometimes. But I'm really curious for you all, like as you were going through your, your master's degrees and your PhDs, what is the greatest lesson that you learned while pursuing that degree? And what do you wish that you had known earlier about the hidden curriculum and would it have changed like the trajectory of your academic career? Oh, this is, so the one thing, the greatest thing I learned is that it's not me, it's you. <laughs> and I know it sounds really kind of blasé, but being a student, again, like the first student to go uni and blah, de, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of people that I went to school with didn't go uni, all that stuff. I didn't, um, 
put anything in terms of me getting good grades. It's just something that was there. So when the rejections started coming through, I was like, wait, what's, what's going on here? Oh, it's me. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Sometimes my kind of accent comes out a bit. Maybe it's that. Um, maybe I'm just not great at, at kind of writing. And later on, when I would go for interviews and the people would would literally say, oh yeah, it's gone to um, someone we know. I'm like, ah, okay, got it, got it. I need to schmooze, but I am not that person. Um, I'm super friendly, but small talk, I can't do it. Um, I'm not gonna make you tea because I don't drink tea. So why do I have to make it for like everyone? It's just not happening. But things, things like that, where it started to become very sort of emotionally difficult to just even do anything because I thought I'm just not good enough when when I kind of found out that this is structural it's not only me and it's systemic I then was like ah well and since then I think I've been kinder to myself and I think that's what a lot of people need to realize that you can do everything, you can do it all right, you can code switch, you can have a first class degree, a distinction masters, and things still not go right. You can publish it and your supervisor will steal the first author. But again, it's not you, it's gonna be a situation where it's systemic and you should just be kinder. Would I have changed it? No, because I am still applying for PhDs and I haven't in some places, where I would have gotten it, but I would have had to play by those rules. But that's a choice. And I think, would I have changed it? No, um, it, it is harder, but no, I, I wouldn't have changed it. Yeah, you, you took me back. It's been a while since I've been a grad student. So <laughs> um, I, I think um, for me, thinking back at those years, there was a lot of lessons that I learned. Um, but I think the biggest one was learning to be okay with being my own person. I think that many times I thought that my identity was based on my graduate degree and the experiments and the papers that I published and um, at the cost of having a personal life. And um, who did I see as my role model at that time? It was my advisor who didn't really have a good work balance, who worked until three in the morning, who expected productivity and output. And I, it, what, it, what Hidden Curriculum did was it validated my personhood, right? And when I realized this is a systemic problem, this isn't me. And by the way, I don't want to be like my advisor it really shifted the way that I treat my students, right? So now I find myself being a very empathetic ad advisor to my students, having real conversations with them about what it's like, you know, to be a person navigating this very oppressive system, right? And, and how do you do it by being authentic to yourself, right? And these were conversations that I never would have had with my advisor, right? But I knew that I didn't want to be that. Right. And I wanted to demonstrate to students, you can still be yourself and still have the success that you want, but in the way that you want it, not in the way that the system wants it. Yes. Um, yeah, that's something I also did with my undergrad. So um, as a PhD student, I um, was able to mentor um, a number of uh, undergraduates for their um, theses and you know I I had those types of conversations with them because I knew what it felt like to be on the other side when there are um, all of these very high expectations or unrealistic goals um, etc and just not being real and upfront um, so um, and you know if I do uh, continue to pursue academia and uh, open up my own lab my own research group those are things that I would definitely um, continue to do um, and even during my postdoc as I would likely be mentoring um, undergrad and grad students um, 
So yeah, I finished my PhD last September and while there were so many lessons, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know, to pick one, I, it's, it's really hard, but um, uh, there was a point when I, I kind of alluded to this in a previous question where I just, I just said, okay, Sean, you, you were using up too much mental energy trying to be uh, something or someone that you're not. Um, so just be yourself. And once I did that, it was like, like multiple tabs in my brain were closed. Like, you know, like on, when you're on Safari or whichever browser, you have all these tabs of papers that you're never going to read um, and it sticks to your computer. That's kind of how I was functioning. I was just like frozen a lot of the time or just processing too much. Um, so I started um, closing those tabs of thinking too much and just being uh, myself. Um, and that was, that was uh, honestly life-changing for me. Um, in my grad school uh, journey, yeah. That's incredible. Um, you know, thinking on the topic of mentorship, because I feel like that's a reoccurring thing that's seemed to come up. One of the really hard things for me to wrap my mind around when I started grad school was that not every PI is a mentor. Like there's a difference um, there and distinguishing that in my mind, like, um, was really tricky for me because I felt that because this person was my PI, they were supposed to support each opportunity or the, or the things that I wanted for my career and my trajectory. Um, and learning that that it doesn't mean that that person's my mentor was was kind of devastating for me. Um, going into that, you know, mentorship being this critical component of academic academic success, what opportunities do you, um, did your mentor provide that were helpful in navigating your academic environment? And also external mentors, which are even more important in some instances, depending on how um, you know your primary mentor may be, were there tools that you learned from external mentors that were helpful in your process? I find I find this this question really funny because just even the concept of a um, mentor and knowing that you should have one is part of the hidden curriculum in the first place. And I didn't know that the you're supposed to have a mentor or someone who is professionally invested in kind of um, helping your in your and endeavors. I, throughout my undergrad, postgrad, didn't have one. And I can 100% say now that I am working in, in industry and it's now actually my um, manager who was helping me do stuff and just opening those doors. It's such a massive thing. And I think the one thing I learned in terms of having a, a mentor is not to be afraid to ask and I think sometimes as well um, that kind of being stuck in your head maybe thinking oh I shouldn't be here um, maybe thinking you're not good enough it does actually stop you asking questions to those mentors who who are there and once you've kind of found one who is good and who is invested and who you feel safe safe with I think you should never be scared to just ask all the questions and that's one of the things I've I've really really learned nothing's a stupid question if you don't know you don't know and you don't know what you don't know so definitely um asking them everything and her encouraging that has been a massive thing for, for Um, yeah, so I absolutely agree that um, that there's there's definitely a lot more mentors and being not afraid to seek them is, is really important. Um, this is a really interesting question because one of the things that I, um, as part of my hidden curriculum research, I, I talk about is the importance of recognizing duality in a mentoring relationship, that it is a relationship <laughs> and not a one-way street, right? And that you have as much to say to your faculty advisor as much as the faculty advisor has to say to you. Um, in answer to your question, when I was in grad student, my advisor 
was my only mentor. Um, and I think that the intention was good. I think that, you know, the, the, the faculty advisor wanted to prepare me for the academic environment. So we had conversations about grant writing, about paper publications, stuff like that. But when it came to the other thing, uh, uh, you know, how to navigate your environment, how to deal with being the only one in your department, how to um, find other mentors, I, I never had any of that. So, um, and that became especially more prevalent when I decided to make a career switch. So if, if you remember my bio at the beginning, I was all the way, <laughs> you know, chem bio um, until my postdoc. And it was in my postdoc that I made the switch in my career. Um, and when I made that switch in my career, my, and I reached out to my faculty advisor and I said, you know, is there anything that you can provide? They said, I'm sorry, you're switching careers. We can't help you. So we, I had to, on my own, find my own mentors and talk to them. And what I realized was that sometimes a simple email saying, hey, I'm interested in hearing about you, you know, what you do in your research or what, you know, what it's like in your, in your work setting. Could you dedicate 15 minutes, spare 15 minutes for me to talk? Um, that really made a difference. Not everyone said yes, but those that did say yes and took those 15 minutes really gave me a lot of rich hidden curriculum that I needed so that I can transition into the other stages. Um, and that really helped me to equip my students to let them know it's not, I am not your only mentor, right? Like I can mentor you in this aspect, but you need mentors across the board and helping them say, reach out to this person, right? Like I am not your only source of information. Other people are too, right? And, and helping them see that it's a network, it's a community um, that that's been really important. Yeah, so um, I agree. My my PhD supervisor, as I would have mentioned, I think uh, a few of the other questions um, discussion, she was the only female black uh, scientist uh, within the Faculty of Science um, for like forever. So we've always like had these um, discussions about. Um, outside of science. So we've always had these discussions about how to navigate the system, et cetera, et cetera. So um, she was an amazing mentor. I shouldn't say what she is because <laughs> we're still in contact. Um, and that, that was very important for me because she would have, you know, guided me about, you know, essentially things to say, things not to say, even though I think like, hate the system but um she helped me to navigate the system um in a way that would be beneficial to myself and also the university in some cases um and if i didn't have have that um mentorship um that mentorship uh, relationship with her I, I i think it would have been a lot more difficult and as um Idalis also noted that um, it's a relationship. I found the first three years, you know, it was more of a um, supervisor speaks to me, like I speak back, but it's, it was more of a, okay, I just take everything you say, I'm not uh, speaking back. Um, and then, well, something switched, I guess it was trying to finish the PhD and the pressure of it all feeling as though I'm going to crumble and then the pandemic oh my god <laughs> um just it, it, it would, there was there was a lot of things happening in my mind and I just had to uh you know we had conversations where I was more open about my opinions and how I felt and that was really great for a relationship so um I really want to reiterate that that mentorship is a two-way street if you find that uh things uh may not be going in a particular direction that you might want you should speak out um and the same like it would go the opposite direction as well um or if you have ideas or contributions that might be contrary to what your your mentor thinks i think you should also speak out and let them know um so like that is also very important to like 
being open and transparent um, on all levels with your mentors. I love that because it's a perfect segue into our next question um, about how the hidden curriculum plays into power dynamics in academia. Um, what advice would you give to students that hope to change these relationships but have fear of pushback? Woo, this is a big question. I mean, um, the hidden curriculum is hidden for a reason. Um, I think the system isn't broken. I think it's working exactly as it was designed to. And I think sometimes as well in academia specifically, that power imbalance um, between whether it's students or whether it's postdocs, it's sort of, for some people, it's a kind of sick rite of passage. And I don't know if that makes sense. It's kind of like, hey, yeah, it was really hard. And my supervisor was, was, you know, horrible, but I made it through. And I have seen um, students who literally, um, let's say they don't drink and the kind of culture is to, to kind of go out and do that, but they are scared of saying no, because they think actually, what if this then makes me seem unfriendly? then it could lead to, to ABC. Um, I have seen sort of supervisors kind of screaming at their students, making them cry, forcing them to do longer hours, discouraging them taking va vacations. And, and I think sometimes it kind of borders into abuse a little bit. And I know it, it sounds dramatic, but yeah, and I think in terms of students fit, like I was in that position where it was just microaggression after microaggression. And I literally said to, to, to my friends, I was like, if I say anything, they, they would know it's me because I'm the only black, black student. So do I say it? What if she doesn't write me a reference? And I think just for students scared of that pushback, I think again, if if your um, mentor is different from your supervisor, super I think getting advice and also having someone in your corner, whether it's a friend, just someone to do a sense check to say, actually, no, you're not going crazy, but what I did, I, I had to make a very difficult decision where I just had to say, you know what, I'm going to speak out and whatever happens, happens because I can't work with this person anyway. And I think um, that, again, is not something that a lot of people would do. But I think maybe finding someone else who can give you advice um, will sometimes be helpful but I do understand that that isn't always the case but the one thing I would say is to please report it um, because we have such a kind of under reporting of things and if your kind of system has somewhere where it can be done anonymously I would highly encourage that but I don't even have an um, answer to that because it was a really difficult thing and I just had to just fight it back because otherwise she would have just kept doing the same thing. Well, first of all, I'm sorry that that happened to you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unfortunate and it, it shouldn't be that way. Um, so this is a very complicated question. Um, I, I will say that there are genuine reasons why someone would not want to speak up. Um, you know, whether they're, you know, they have a family that is depending on them or, or some other, you know, they need health insurance. I mean, there, there's many, many, many reasons why people won't speak up. Um, but that said, it doesn't mean that you do not have power to say no in different ways, right? Um, and I think that that's really important because truth be told, the faculty depends on you to make the experiments. <laughs> not the other way around, right? So you have some power in this situation, right? Um, what I would say is find yourself both internal and external mentors. Um, and the reason I say that is internal mentors 
that may know the system, that may know how policies work, that may know procedures is really important. Because if you don't know how to report something, if you don't know who to contact and who might be trustworthy, that's just as daunting as having someone else that's outside of your institution who doesn't know how things operate internally, right? With that said, you can't necessarily always trust whoever's inside your institution. So you do need external mentors and people to be able to look at things from the outside to give you some tips and strategies. And I would say that those that are on the outside are really good accountability partners, people that can tell you, okay, say no, and this is how you say no, right? Whereas the internal ones can basically say, um, well, if you're gonna say no, well, this is the process by which you say no. Right? And important. Um, and you may be surprised where you find them. You may be having, a, I don't know, a grad school, graduate student a liaison or representative that may be a good person to contact, right? Whoever is a chair of a graduate program, depending on whether you trust them or not in your department or close to that department will make a big difference, right? Um, being able to know how to navigate internally, but also be accountable externally, I think is important on both ends. Yeah, like that's really excellent uh, advice. Um, in my time at grad school, I was also the president of the grad student association so that was for all 4,000 grad students um, at McMaster and if they had issues um, with their supervisor or you know issues otherwise uh, they would contact us and we would kind of be like a third party um, so I sat in meetings that have been very very tense um, just because um, of this communication barrier so um, yeah, so I echo um, those sentiments about finding an internal and external um, person to talk about the issue with. And in some cases, I wish I did that because I am so uh, <laughs> quick to respond sometimes. Um, and it didn't always work in my favor in terms of saying no. Um, I, but you know, we made it work in the in the end, uh, we <laughs> we came to amicable um, um, amicable moments, but I mean, I wish I did that more um, because, and even when I did, I still didn't listen. I was a bit stubborn at times, but you know, that's finishing a PhD is stressful. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, they're legitimate fears though. Um, I had a friend who was, like extremely scared to speak to her uh, supervisor because you know you want a good reference letter you're going to need reference letters um, from your your supervisors and she's known this particular PI to write bad reference letters for his students because they said no or because they they spoke back so yeah it's 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 difficult to navigate you know, I want to, I, can I address that? Because I, as a faculty member, I, I think that's a misconception, Sean, if, if you allow me, like thinking that you need a letter from your advisor to get a different job um, is, is another hidden curriculum that they make you think. Many times when you apply to a job, if you do have a bad relationship with an advisor um, and, and you do meet the other, I don't know, three letters that they ask for, they will ask you you know, why wasn't your advisor included? And that may give you an opportunity to explain that there were maybe some disagreements. Um, but as you can see from the other letters, you know, I am someone that is collegial that can work well in teams and so forth. So it doesn't always necessarily mean that you need um, your faculty's letter to get a job. So I hope that helps. <laughs> definitely helpful for me because, you know, those are things that I have thought about um, in the past as I transition and throughout my career, if I want to stay in academia or transition to policy, um, trying to keep a good rapport with that mentor, even if it's difficult, um, knowing that information is really helpful. Thank you. Sometimes you can burn the bridge, Paige, um, and that's okay. Uh, but what you do want to make sure is that the other letters are strong or stronger, right, than your advisor. 
Absolutely. And I want to thank you for answering that question in the chat that was asked. Um, the question was, do you have any examples of institutions that have been taking steps to unhide the hidden curriculum or to dismantle it entirely? If so, to what extent have they succeeded? Um, I want to offer that question up to the rest of you all too. Um, and I also want to encourage the folks who are in the audience to ask any questions in the chat um, as well. But the response that Dallas gave was, yes, there are currently efforts in some programs and institutions to unhide the hidden curriculum. I'm thinking right now of the Arizona State University who has an initiative to debunk the fears of office hours. They have YouTube campaigns to encourage students to have conversations with faculty. Other ways to do this is brown bags, panels, changing syllabus language to be more inclusive and allowing students for um, student reflections that can inform future curriculum sh um, changes, which is really amazing. Um, I want to offer that question to the other panelists too. Yeah, and that is fantastic. I mean, this is literally my job. Um, it's to sort of ensure the success of students who are non-traditional to higher education. And I've been, been looking at it in two different um, ways. So the first one is the kind of actual academic hidden curriculum. So it's the kind of language you are supposed to use and the way to write and the way to critically analyze that actually you wouldn't know until someone teaches it to you. And that is not something that is taught in kind of lots of public schools or um, like we say comprehensive schools. So what I am currently doing, I am working on a specific phrase bank where it literally teaches students how to specifically answer those questions. So it doesn't give you the knowledge, you still have to like study and, you know, learn it. But in terms of not knowing how to kind of structure your work and not kind of knowing the words to use, especially students who were they speak multiple languages and it's a little bit difficult to kind of switch between um so i'm doing that as well and that hopefully will then kind of open the um um academic side and kind of helps students in that way but also i think one thing institutions should be doing and this is very unpopular um and i was arguing with someone on twitter about this is we actually need to just tell students what's going on. So for, for example, we've got massive awarding gaps where, where Black and um, Asian students, especially in the UK, are not getting those, those top grades. But majority of students do not know about this. So they then don't actually know that what they are doing is feeding in to that. And I think, um, people cannot play a game where they don't know what the rules are. So telling people that this is actually what's going on is a massive thing. And obviously you will have students who will feel downtrodden, but again, you've given them the knowledge and you've given them the, the tools. I am also doing lots of things around training which has been very interesting. So training staff about whiteness and what whiteness is and the ideologies behind being professional. And I'm teaching them a lot about code switching. Some of it is successful. Some of it is a bit, it's a battle, but again, letting all those people know about that can really, really be, um, be, ver be very helpful. But then it is also us. So those of us who've kind of fought and clawed and code switched and got there, I think it's now up to us to just be ourselves. They can't fire you now. Just be yourselves and, and just let other students and other people see that. Um, yeah, as for McMaster, I don't know. I, I feel like they're trying, but maybe not. Uh... They're trying, um, but well, one of the things that um, Fatmara just mentioned, it's about being transparent and open, like from the university admin side, um, that, you know, that partly played into why I ran for president for the GSA, because I was able to 
meet with the university admin and really understand how how this structure works. Like I met with the president, the provost, like all of the important people, important people, um, quite quite regularly um, to really understand what is the mastermind behind this this. Uh, system and how that's running. And there are a lot of things that we would have uh, communicated to students that, you know, other people within the organization would be like, oh, Sean, are you sure you want to communicate that? Are you sure you? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> um, these are equal stakeholders. Like it's the students' money that's actually running this organization, this system. Um, so they should know. Um, so I think if you have people in those, those types of positions to help uh, run those things and that's very important because otherwise it's just going to like just it's just going to be stagnant and their efforts are just going to be um they're just going to go to a certain point but not you know to the actual point that's actually going to drive change or or be actually informative Absolutely. You all have given us so much to think about um, during this conversation and have definitely, um, you know, given me a little bit of a boost for how I can navigate my own environment um, with the hidden curriculum and maybe supporting other students who may be coming after me in these spaces. Um, I want to um, conclude on a high note since we're about to wrap up really soon. And I want to get any final words that um, you all may have to the students or faculty um, or other folks, um, maybe not students or faculty who just decided to attend this panel. Um, like what advice would you give to them um, and what final words would you give to them on the hidden curriculum? Um, one thing I would say, and I think Sylvia has kind of alluded to it. So do we respect the high hierarchy or can we speak to them as peers? I think <clears throat> doing sometimes when your code switching or when you are in these places, you can feel a bit of yourself kind of shrinking. So whether it's your personality, whether you can't talk about um, who you are and you're not bringing yourself to that place. One final thing I would say is try as much as possible to kind of learn those rules, but make it work for you. So for me, it doesn't work for, for me, to specifically dress a certain way. Um, it doesn't work for me to kind of speak a certain way because I don't know, know how to, but I can switch back and forth and that works for me. So making it work for you without actually losing your sense of self and your sense of identity, because again, like we said, a lot of these structures are very westernized and a lot of us will struggle to fit there. So. Do not go crazy trying to fit into a system that wasn't built for you. You can get there and be yourself and do things slowly and change things, but just don't lose your sense of identity. Yeah, I have a lot to say, but I'll keep it short. I, I think um, two things, the, the, the power of the collective, I think is really important in hidden curriculum knowing that you're not the only one, knowing that you can create strategic partnerships to navigate the hidden curriculum and, and make change. Um, I think there was a question about the status quo. The status quo is huge because it's a system, but if there's different groups of people working towards the system, right, then, then it is an attainable outcome, right, and a goal, um, but, but you need to form those collective partnerships to be able to make the change that you want. Um, at the same time, I also am a big proponent of small C changes when it comes to yourself, right? Because I do think that over time, similar to like a water dripping into a rock, it eventually will break open, right? And so, you know, th think about yourself and where you come from and how th things like, for example, like how, how do you want your, you know, to be called, right? Like a lot of people don't talk about that, but for someone like myself, that's a Latina, two, two last names are really important. And so I've been starting to incorporate my two last names in, in my email signatures, right? Like how do, you, how do you bring yourself in different unique ways, even through small forms of communication? Yeah, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot to say, but um, 
I guess what I what I'm about to say, I guess, kind of merges some of the thoughts that um, both of you have, have mentioned. Um, Mary asked a question about why aren't we disrupting the status quo? But as as both of you said, it's about building um, partnerships and networks. So I was only able to speak to the president of the university or the provost, et cetera, as peers and not um, this like person higher than than me um, because we developed a partnership and a um, like yeah a, a partnership essentially um, I know students who are like very like you know fiery like oh I want to do this like let's blah 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 um, and like the university admin don't respond to them um, because there's <laughs> It's not in a in a in, in a way that they can understand, I guess. Um, so, because I was able to have that partnership, that um, that rapport, um, you know, I could speak very calmly and be like, okay, you know what? Like this is rubbish. Y'all need to change this soon. We have some angry students, but like, please, we need to make some progress on this. Um, uh, I have a few examples, but I don't, I don't know if I should really talk about them publicly, but um, yeah, just, I was just able to speak with them in a way that, you know, because they respect me, um, they were able to put out some communications and clear some things up. Um, so yes, disrupt the status quo, but do it smartly, like have people that can uh, help you navigate the system. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think those are my my final words. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for your insight and your advice, um, all of your knowledge. Um, we've learned so much during this panel. Um, I want to thank everybody who came and is in attendance for this webinar. We are recording it, so it will be available on our Black and Neural YouTube channel. Um, again, Cleona dropped in the chat that we have our links for the um, NINS webinar that we um, put together not too long ago. Um, she also dropped the link for the BIN YouTube account and also our seminar series nomination form where you can nominate any speaker um, to be a part of our seminar series. Again, thank you guys so much for being here. This has been incredible. Um, and I hope you all tune in for more events. Have a great Friday, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for having for us. Invitation. Yeah. Thank you, Mary, for your comments in the chat as well. <laughs>